Now, there are a range of uses of educational technologies, obviously in the classroom and in universities and in businesses. But there are also a range of roles for those that are specialised in the employment of educational technologies. Now, many teachers, of course, utilise educational technologies, as do academics and pretty much everyone. But there are a number of professional roles around the employment of educational technologies. Now, the first of these has been instructional design. It's been around for a long time. Essentially, it's for those that didn't have a teaching degree or particular training and qualifications in education to create learning activities generally facilitated by technology that were originally incorporated into corporate training processes but also very much used in a university training environment where again most of the academics don't have formal qualifications in teaching but do work with instructional designers around how to craft um, learning activities and lessons and lectures and things of that nature. This role generally focuses on the use of the technologies, particularly the learning management systems, but also creating little um, interactives or video clips or activities that are used by students. Um, as we've moved into online learning, it's become a much larger, more expanded role because of the more specialised um, expertise that's able to be brought that we don't generally expect all um, practitioners to have a lot of experience with creating online learning objects and activities and processes. In the main though, most um, lessons and lectures and tutorials and so forth are developed by teachers and by lecturers and academics themselves. It's the more specialised ones that normally go into particular multimedia applications or very high quality online courses that tend to utilise instructional designers extensively. So over time, the process of instructional design has developed a number of models. The main one being the ADDIE model. Um, so you can read about that, but it's simply a design process for creating learning activities and then evaluating them and, and so forth. There's been a number of other models. The um, Dick and Carney model is probably the, one of the most popular other than the Addy model. But over time, instructional design became a bit, a bit too rigid. It wasn't really ex um, incorporating much of our learning of pedagogy and how the learning process occurs that has been developed in other areas of education. So then we saw the development of what was called learning designers, which took the instructional design metaphor and went a bit further to start um, primarily focusing on the learner rather than on the um, instructional material. That was sort of the first big shift. But it then also started incorporating the assessment process and more of, an, of a feedback mechanism so that as students were presented with information to learn, they were then often customised in how they then went about learning that. And the assessment was then conducted in order to enhance that customization, so that students would receive easier material if they were having difficulties or harder material or more comprehensive material if they were breezing through various instructional material. So learning design became a little bit more complicated, uh, very much mirroring what a teacher does in a classroom environment where they get to know their students and start tailoring and crafting lessons and learning activities for individuals. Over time then, that has evolved into what's called learning engineering. This is bringing in other experts, particularly, um, say, psychologists and um, more understanding of cognitive processes to assist with the crafting of the learning experience. So essentially now we're engineering the experience that learners have as they go through their learning journeys. It tends to rely a lot on data um, and also utilising AI systems 
to again understand what's happening with the learning process and make modifications to what students experience based upon the data that's being collected. Now beyond that there's now an emerging well so first before that um, this has embraced a understanding in education called design-based learning where we go through an iterative process of learning so we learn we then understand what we've learnt and then we build upon what we need to then learn further to go through a cyclical process of improving our learning now that process has also been applied to the design of learning experiences where again it's a cyclical process of researching and understanding what's happening with the learning experience and then making changes and improving upon that for the next iteration so again design-based learning and design-based instruction has been around for a while but it's certainly an area that's becoming embraced by the learning engineering aspect now We've also started understanding that learning is much more complicated than just the technical aspects of the learning process. And a new field is emerging called the learning sciences. This is recognizing the benefit of bringing into teams of learning designers, um, psychologists, cognitive scientists, um, and a whole range of other expertise that can contribute their own specialities to making the students learning experience more effective and profound in terms of their learning. So there's been a range of different fields that have been brought together to assist in managing this process and we're collectively calling that the learning sciences. So finally there's an aspect that's again been around for a while but it's becoming more and more popular called universal design for learning. Now originally this was intended to ensure that all students regardless of their um, capabilities were going to have a effective learning experience particularly those that had particular disadvantages or disabilities. Over time though it was recognized that every student has particular um, differences that means so certain things work well with them and certain things don't work well with them and it very much became a framework for individualization um, identifying what were the best circumstances for a particular student be they with severe um, vision impairment or a particular interest and passion in harry potter what would be the best way of crafting a learning experience so that they would best learn from that experience. So that's the Universal Design for Learning Framework. Have a look at that model. It goes into more detail, um, particularly looking at the three main aspects, multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. So again, this comes from the three different perspectives of the learner, of the instructor, and of the learning experience, of the learning space. Now, what I'd like you to do is to try to unpack that model. And in Teams, I'd like you to use the Universal Design for Learning model to explore the learning experience that you did in the first um, activity and think about how you would use multiple forms of representation, expression, and engagement in that learning activity.